All right, everybody. Hi, it's Jeff from Ayelet Tours. And since 1986, we've been connecting people to Israel and the Jewish world. We are the official travel partner for Hadassah trips to Israel. We run Jewish singles trips through our Best Day Adventures division. And of course, of course, of course, we run uh, traveling university tours all over the world featuring outstanding scholars such as Professor Stephen Burke. Professor Burke, you just got back from Cuba. Certainly did, Jeffrey, and we had a wonderful trip. And if any of the people who are participants in that trip are listening, uh, again, I thank you for coming along. And I think you'll agree with me that we did have a wonderful time. Cuba is a very, very interesting place. Not the best time in Cuba for the Cubans, uh, but an interesting time and a, 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 a fun time to a certain extent for those of us who travel there. Uh, well, it's an anxiety that, uh, let's say, the day will come, the day will come when uh, the communist government of Cuba is no more and things will get better. But for us, for those who travel there, we see the local Jewish communities and Ayelet and the people who participate play a, a very important role in keeping these Jews alive. A trip to Cuba is the performance of a mitzvah. So if we do this again, uh, I, I think you should get, consider it. We, well, we've got it on the uh, on the docket for next December. So if people are interested, of course, let us know. Professor Burke's got a couple other trips coming up in the uh, in the coming year. Of course, in February, we're doing uh, a Snowbird Scholar Weekend down in Florida, February three through five. Uh, so uh, there's still a uh, a discount, an early bird discount going on. So if you're interested, it's starting to get a little cold up here in the Northeast. Uh, I encourage you to check it out and hopefully join Professor Burke down in Florida in February, and then in the summer. You've got uh, two trips coming up. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about uh, Europe, uh, Eastern Europe and Italy? Well, we have a trip to Eastern Europe uh, in the second half of June. This is a very interesting time in Eastern Europe. We go, among other places, we go to, to Warsaw and Krakow. And at Krakow, we go to this marvelous institution, the Jewish Community Center of Krakow, which has hundreds of members and is now playing a major role in helping the Ukrainian refugees who are coming in. This is a moment in history that you'll be able to tell your children and your grandchildren about. I mean, this terrible war is going on in the Ukraine. People are leaving in large numbers. How long they will stay where they are leaving or where they're going to, we do not know. But they are going, a large number, the greatest bulk of them really are going to Poland. And a number of them are in, going to be in Krakow. We will meet with some of those Ukrainian refugees and we will meet with the people who are helping them. Again, it's a moment of history, a moment in history, and that together with all of the other things that we will see in the East European trip really make it a, a very, very exciting trip. The second trip is to Italy. Italy is Italy. I don't have to tell you too much about that. We will talk about Italy in the time of ancient Rome. We'll talk about Italy during the period of the Renaissance. We'll talk about Italy in the modern period, modern Italy. We'll talk about the Vatican. We'll talk about the Second World War, and we'll talk about Italy after the Second World War. We will see all of the sites, the great sites that everybody sees, and we'll deal with, of course, the Jewish side as well. Uh, we've done this before, as we've done the East European trip before. Uh, it is a, a scintillating trip. So both trips are very exciting. I look forward to them, and I hope that some of you will join us. Well, uh, just, of course, people should keep in mind, both trips are filling up. So if you are interested, now is the time. Uh, we've got a lot of other trips. Uh, hopefully people saw the screen at the beginning. Uh, there'll be a trip to Argentina of, of, of all times. I hope, Professor Burke, you watched the World Cup final. Did you see the game? No. Oh, come on. I read it was about a Jeffrey. I'm not a soccer fan. I'm, I'm not, not a soccer fan. fan. Who's a soccer fan in the States? People are, but no, but yeah, this, this is one moment every four years where soccer fans, it was an I incredible know. game. So consider, if you consider in March, we're going to Argentina, maybe you'll, you'll uh, if people join, uh, uh, they'll get a chance to meet Lionel Messi in person. That's with uh, Yale Strom and Elizabeth Schwartz. So you can find all the information about that. Uh, a, a Croatian cruise in the fall. Uh, my gosh, we have so many things going on. Check it all out on our website, Ayala. Dot com. Before uh, I turn it over to you, Professor Burke, for uh, this evening's presentation, I just I have to ask one thing of people. I'm in the Albany office, the Albany office of Ayala Tours, 
And uh, I found this, uh, it's very appropriate for the holiday. Uh, this has been here in this office for at least a decade. Uh, his name is, is Sid. This is Sid Bear. And my question, if anybody out there has encountered a Sid Bear, if you could just put it in the chat and let me know. I'd like to know how unique this is uh, before we put it up on, on eBay. Uh, he used to, you used to be able to press his, uh, his little paw here and he would say, Oi, do I love chocolate. And I can't tell you how many times I heard that sound before this thing died. So uh, on behalf of all of us at Ayala Tours and, and on behalf of Sid Bear, wishing everybody a happy Hanukkah. And uh, with that, Professor Burke, for this evening's presentation on the true story of the Maccabees, I will turn it over to you. The real geschichte, the real truth about the Maccabees. I too would like to say to all of you, Chag Sameach, my friends. And I hope uh, bad weather is coming down the pike. I hope all of you will be warm and I hope all of you are well. Once again, thank you for joining us. For those of you who have heard me before, I say, I could almost say, almost ad nauseum. You cannot explain the present by the present. Everything has a history. And so if Hanukkah, is our present in the terms of, in terms of the historical present. Uh, this is the time 167 to 160 before the common era. So we are talking about, again, two, almost two centuries before the common era. So where should one begin? Uh, any discussion here has to begin with the development of anti-Judaism, not yet anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a racial discussion of the Jews a belief that the Jews were an insidious race. Anti-Judaism is an attack upon the Jewish religion. And the great historian, one of the, not the most reliable of historians, but certainly the great first century Jewish historian who provides us with information about things that, that are provided by no one else, Joseph, uh, Josephus, he says, he asks the question, where does this hostility to the Jews begin? And the answer he gives is probably the correct answer. It doesn't begin, most people think it begins with Christianity. It doesn't begin with Christianity. There was a good deal of hostility to the Jews. There was a good deal of philo-Semitism, that's likely of the Jews in the ancient period, but there was a good deal of antipathy, of hostility towards the Jews. And he says it begins in Egypt. Now, Hanukkah is upon us. In several months, we will enjoy Passover. The story of the Jewish exodus, God leading the Hebrews out. Remember in the traditional Haggadah, there's no mention, no mention of Moses and Aaron, no mention at all. The point of the Haggadah is God led the Hebrews out. But what people, some people may not be aware of, there's an Egyptian counter narrative. That is, the Egyptians develop another story. But they accepted the idea that the Jews let, left Egypt. But for them, in the Egyptian narrative, the Jews were thrown out of Egypt. We couldn't stand them, said the Egyptians. They were lepers. They desecrated our gods. We threw them out. In other words, for a long period of time, before the common era, and even before the Greeks come into Egypt, there is a good deal of hostility towards the Jews. A number of historians are now beginning to argue that this, Greek, this Egyptian hostility towards the Jews passed into the Greeks. The Greeks took over Egypt. Alexander the Great conquers Egypt in the fourth century of the, before the common era. The Greeks took that. They borrowed from the Egyptians or imbibed from the Egyptians this hostility towards the Jews, which of course the impetus for that came for a number of Jewish, of Jewish revolts against the Greeks. So the point again in all of this is the anti-Judaism begins in the Egyptian period, passes over into the Greeks. And then Alexander died really at a young age, probably 35 or 36 years old, sometime in the second half of the fourth century before the common era. The empire that he created, this vast empire that extended into Persia, this vast empire was now divided between two generals, Seleucus and Ptolemy. Seleucus got Syria and Palestine and the areas to the east. Ptolemy got Egypt and the areas to the west. There was a good deal of conflict between the two, and the conflict is going to really eventually lead to one of the descendants of Seleucus, Antiochus III. 
This is the man who is known as Antiochus the Great, the early, the latter period of the third century of the common era coming into the latter part of, the, again, the latter part of the second century of the common era. So we're talking about, let us say, 220 to about, let's say, about the 170s of the, uh, before the common era. This is Antiochus the third, the man is known as Antiochus the Great. Antiochus tried to extend the Seleucid Empire. He moved, he crossed the red line. He moved into Egypt. He wanted to take part of Egypt, as well as part of what used to be called Asia Minor and even into the Balkans. The problem here was not for the opposition from the Egyptians, but from the empire that was being born and the empire that was going to come. That is the Roman Empire. For those of you who remember, your, if you remember your classical and ancient history, Rome's got its hands full with the Carthaginians, with the people in Carthage, who were really Phoenicians. And what took place, three wars with Carthage. These are known as the Punic Wars. They're called the Punic Wars because Punic was the, the Latin name for Carthage. The wars go on and on, and eventually Rome is going to triumph. The Romans are coming, and there's a story here that the Roman envoy, Roman diplomat, goes into Egypt and tells Antiochus III, Antiochus the Great, to get out of Egypt. And Antiochus waffles here. This is a man who has been victorious in battle, defeated lots of enemies, defeated Egyptians, defeated all sorts of people. And, what is, and the, the Roman envoy says to Antiochus III, he says to him, you gotta get out. And Antiochus says, oh, I'm not getting out. The story goes that the Roman envoy took a piece of chalk, a piece of some paint, and drew a circle around the throne that Antiochus III was sitting on. And the Roman envoy said to Antiochus, before you get out of that circle, before you cross the lines of that circle, you better give me an answer. And he did. Antiochus III gave the Romans an answer. We're getting out of Egypt. Now, Antiochus III was a man that was fairly tolerant. He may have been an aggressor, an expansionist, wanted to expend, extend the Seleucid Empire, but he was a tolerant man. He did not put any pressure upon the Jews, nor did he put any pressure upon any other people. As long as you paid your taxes, as long as you didn't revolt against Antiochus III, you were in good shape. That is, he did not tamper, did not force any religiosity, any paganism upon the Jews or anybody else. But personality counts in history. And his, uh, his son, Antiochus IV, or Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes means Antiochus in the image of God. Whether he was an egomaniac, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, I can't tell you what, 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 what was wrong with him or what he believed, but certainly on the surface, this is a man who has a very heightened view of himself. He considers himself a God. He considers himself a divinity. But he knows that Rome is coming. He knows that the Romans are coming. And what he probably wants to do is batten down the hatches. That is, he wants to make sure that everybody in his part, that is in the Seleucid Empire, is loyal to him. He does not want diversity. He wants a monolithic state, a monolithic empire. He wants everybody to, to you to a certain line. Now, this is the culmination of a conflict or a tension that has been going on probably for 200 to 250 years. That's the conflict between Athens and Jerusalem. Uh, th this, is, this is a complex battle, but I, I will do it as succinctly as I can. Let me put it to you this way. The Greek comes, the Greeks come into Judea. Alexander the Great, he doesn't come. There's a story in the Talmud that he does come, but he really doesn't come. He doesn't go to the Holy of Holies and things like that. But the Greeks take Judea as they take Egypt, Alexandria is their great creation, and they move all to the midst, they move into Persia, and they move into, into certain parts of India. Now the Greeks come to the Jews, and the Greek says to the Jew, why don't you eat pork? Give us a reason. How does the Greek arrive at, at the truth? The Greek arrives at logic. He wants to get a logical explanation from the Jew as why the Jews don't eat pork. There is no logical answer to that. There is only one answer. That's the traditional Jewish answer. That's, that's Torah mi Sinai. That's the Torah that was given to us. That's the law that was given to us. Kashrut is a law given to us 
on Mount Sinai. That's it. No logical explanation, no reason for it. That's what it is. And then the Greek says to the Jew, why do you rest on your seventh day, the Sabbath? Are you, you, are you physically infirm? What is your reasoning here? And again, the correct Jewish answer is, this is Torah me Sinai. This is something that God ordered through the Torah for Jews to observe the Sabbath and to rest on that day. The Greek looks at the Jew and says, you're absolutely crazy. The Greek also says, look, we are in Egypt. We are in North Africa. We are in the Balkans. We are in Persia. And what we do is we marry with everybody else. We intermarry. Why won't you marry with us? Why won't you let your young men and women marry into our community? And the Jew says, we're not supposed to do that. We're just not supposed to do it. It's our tradition. We don't do it. So there's long-standing tension here that goes on. What Antiochus Epiphanes is doing is bringing it to a conclusion. So this is a war that's going to go on and on and on. I gave you the dates, 167 to 160. But the fact of the matter is this war goes on for another 30 to 40 years. And there will be times when the Maccabees lose. Judah Maccabee is killed in the year, in the year 160 before the Common Era. And the Seleucids will come. They'll come back into Jerusalem. That we don't tell our children in the Hanukkah story. It's a long-standing battle, and it's only when the, one of the younger sons of the Maccabees, Jonathan, is going to finally defeat the Seleucids. And finally, Judea will be restored. So here we have a battle that goes on and on, taking lots and lots of people. But remember also, I'm sure you are aware of this, and that is this is a civil war as well. Because in that conflict between Athens and Jerusalem, many Jews living in Judea wanted to be like the Hellenized Greeks, the Hellenized Syrians. They wanted to be Greeks. They wanted to participate in the Olympic Games. They wanted to study mathematics. They wanted to study physics. This is a classic example here of assimilation. It's something that can carries down into the present day. So the point is, how much do you take of the society that you admire? And how much do you hold on to the tradition? So please do, uh, keep in mind, this is not only a war between the Hellenized Syrians and the Jews and some of the Jews, but it's also a war among the Jews. Not the first time in history that there's a war among the Jews, and unfortunately not the last time in history that, they will, that there's a war uh, between the Jews. So uh, again, it's a civil war. Usually the center of Hellenized Jewry is in the cities, in Jerusalem and some of the other cities in Judea. But this is, where, this is at the time, and for a long period of time, this is an agrarian country. Most of the people, most of the Jews living in Judea were peasants, they were farmers. For them, Hellenization was a violation of tradition. This is nothing new in history. We know people in the countryside tend to be more conservative and tend to be more traditional. So once again, please, for the third time, this is not only a war between the Hellenized Syrians and uh, the Maccabees and their supporters, but it's also a war among the Jews. The basic sources for all of this are the five books of the Maccabees. That's the, that's the basic source in all of this. There are five books. The most important are the, the first book of the Maccabees and the second book of the Maccabees. These books are not included in the Jewish Bible. Remarkable. When you think of it, it's absolutely remarkable. There are, in the entire Jewish Bible, there are many, many books, the prophets, the Psalms, all of the, the Torah, of course, kings, and so on. The two books of the Maccabees are not included in the Jewish Bible, yet they remain our primary source for what had taken place. They were written, we think, by contemporaries, and interestingly enough, while in the Jewish Bible, the first two books of the Maccabees are not included, they are included in the Catholic Bible. The Catholic Bible will have the first two books of the Maccabees. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Why aren't the books of the Maccabees, why aren't they included in the Jewish Bible? And the answer is the rabbis who are going to canonize the Bible 
and the rabbis who will develop the Jewish religion in the aftermath of the destruction of the temples, they don't like the Maccabees. The rabbis did not like the Maccabees, and they had good reason not to like them. Number one, again, the Maccabees, remember they are known by other names. The Hebrew name for the Maccabees, uh, excuse me, the Hebrew name is the Hashmonaim. The Greek name is the Hasmoneans. So the Hasmoneans, the Hashmonaim, and the Maccabees, they're all one and the same. And I hate to tell you this, my friends, I hate to tell you. Once you get through Judah and Jonathan and Matityahu, once you get through with all of these guys, all of these men, it's all downhill for the Maccabees, for the Hashmonaim or the Hasmoneans. They were not a nice bunch of people. They were not model citizens. And the rabbis were aware of this. What do I mean when I say they were not model citizens? What I mean is that after Jonathan, the Maccabees, or the Has again, the Hashmonaim or the Hasmoneans, are going to do some very nasty things. First of all, they kill each other. Brothers kill brothers. They kill relatives. They're struggling for power. They're struggling for the high priesthood. That's what they're struggling for. They're corrupt as hell. And they really, again, they're not a nice bunch. In addition to them, in addition to that, one of the Maccabees crosses the red line. Not only does he want to be the high priest, he wants to be the king of the Jews. He wants to be a king. For those of you who have even the most cursory knowledge of Jewish history, you know the tradition is that a king of the Jews, a king of Israel, has to be a descendant of the Davidic line, has to be a descendant of David. Well, the Hashmanayim or the Maccabees, Hasmonians, were not. They were not descendants. And the rabbis don't like that. They really don't like that. That's a violation of the halacha. That's a violation of Jewish law. In addition to that, the rabbis had another problem. And that was to celebrate the Maccabean revolt could set a dangerous precedent. It already had. Now here, I don't want to lose you, my friends. I'm jumping ahead now to the destruction of the temple in the first century of the common era. That is in the Jewish revolt 66 to 73. How could any Jew with a brain in his head in that period of time, 66 to 73 of the common era, how could a Jew with a brain in his head really believe that they could stand against Rome? Nobody stood against Rome. The Romans beat everybody. They beat the Greeks, they beat the Gauls, they beat everybody, wherever they went, the Romans were invincible. How could the Jews believe that they could take on Rome? And the answer is, they had the Maccabean revolt. They, we defeated the Hellenized uh, Syrians, God is with us and God will be with us again. The temple of course is in Jerusalem, God surely will not allow the temple to be destroyed. In other words, you can draw a direct line between the Maccabean revolt and the revolt against Rome. And the rabbis saw what happened in that revolt against Rome. The temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed. Tens of thousands of Jews were killed. Tens of thousands more were taken as slaves. When we get to Rome on this trip in the summer, I will take you to the Arch of Titus. Titus was the Roman general and then later the Roman emperor. He's the man that destroyed Jerusalem. He's the man that carted large numbers of Jews back to, Jer back to Rome, and the Arch of Titus commemorates that. And in the inside of the Arch of Titus are figurines of Jews in chains carrying the Holy Scrolls into Rome. So again, there's a direct line, and the rabbis are worried about it. We don't want it. The rabbis are really saying, we don't want to hear anything about revolts. Revolts got us into trouble before. We don't want to get into trouble again. Somehow we are in the Galut, in the diaspora, and even if we live within, within Judea under Roman control, there must never be another revolt against Rome. <laughs> no one's, people will not listen to that because I know 75 years later, there'll be another revolt against Rome, which will lead even to more disaster. So the point is the rabbis are not going to glorify. They don't like to talk. They'll talk about Hanukkah, as we'll see in a few minutes, but they're not going to emphasize, in fact, they're not even going to mention the revolt against Rome. For the rabbis, the, what's important is the miracle. The, the temple is cleansed, the lights of the, uh, the menorah 
are going to be lit. And again, that's the miracle of Hanukkah for the rabbis. One little flask of oil lasts eight days. That's what it is. That's all there is. No talk about revolt. The other is, again, I move ahead here, not long ahead, but this is the time, a little bit later than the Maccabean revolt, this is the time of the conflict between the Sadducees, the priestly class, and the Pharisees, the prototype rabbis. The rabbis don't want to glorify the priesthood. The Maccabees were Kohanim, they were priests. And the Pharisees, the, the prototype rabbis, are going to emphasize the oral law, they're going to emphasize all sorts of things. They do not want to exaggerate or let us say give any glory to the priesthood here. This is a struggle between the priests, the Sadducees, and the Kohanim. So for all of these reasons, we are not going to see any glorification of the revolt against Rome. That's why those first two books of the Maccabees, they are not included in the Jewish Bible. Now you may want to ask me, say, since I made reference to this, you may say, well, why is it included in the Catholic Bible? Now, I'm not sure, again, how many times have I said to you, those of you who've heard me lecture, this is not, history is not mathematics, it's not science. You cannot say A plus B produces C. You simply cannot do it. What we think is the Catholics included, again, the first two series of the Maccabees, because there are instances of martyrdom there. The story of Hannah and her seven sons, for example, dying because they won't bow down to an idol. Again, this is the early history of the church is one in which, uh, the, the early Christian church, which is the Catholic church, the Catholic church is experiencing martyrdom. The Roman pagans are killing them. They're experiencing a difficult time. They probably included the first two books of the Maccabees in the Catholic Bible as an inspiration to Catholics to cling to their faith uh, in, in the face, in the face of, of, of terrible crimes that were perpetrated against them. The rabbis also, again, there are certain things that took place uh, as the rabbis dealt with Hanukkah. How many candles should you light? All right, we light eight candles, right? Eight candles. There is a discussion in the Talmud between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel. Beit Shammai, the house of Shammai, the great rabbi, is going to say, on the first night of Hanukkah, you light eight candles. This is a time of enthusiasm and joy that throughout the holiday, there will never be the same enthusiasm as on the first night. So light eight candles the first night, seven the seventh night, six, and so on down the way. Beit Hillel says, no, we move up. That is, you light one candle the first night, second candle, third, and, and so on. Because each time we move up and we increase our enthusiasm. The Jewish tradition has sided with Beit Hillel. That's the way we, that's the way we do it at the present time. That's the way we do it up to the present time. All of this, I must tell you, takes place in the second and third centuries of the common era. Before that period of time, the Jews celebrated Hanukkah. That they did. There was an oral tradition, and some of them may have been familiar with the first two books of the Maccabees. But no talk about the miracle here. No talk, no talk, no lighting of candles. No lighting of candles at the time that Judah had, uh, had, had been victorious and had cleansed the temple. There were, nobody lit candles for another 300 to 350 years. So here we are, the conflict between Athens and Jerusalem. Then we've got this type of thing, that is the war itself, that goes on, I must tell you, probably until the year 137 before the Common Era. And lots of defeats, but eventually a Jewish victory. And the rabbis are going to get hold of it. The rabbis will transform the way we deal with Hanukkah. And they will try to give it a religious solemnity. On the days of Hanukkah, we recite Hallel. That's a special prayer. We also read from the Torah on the days of Hanukkah. And we insert in the prayer book some prayers about Hanukkah. Hanukkah cannot be a major Jewish holiday because it's not listed in the Torah. But it becomes, for some people, it becomes a very, very important holiday. Now, it becomes an element of inspiration for people long removed from Judea, long removed from Judea. So, for example, in Russia. Now, in 1903, in April of 1903, 
There took place the greatest pogrom up until 1918, 19, and 20, the pogroms in the Ukraine against the Jews. But up until that period of time, the greatest pogrom was the Kishinev pogrom in, the, in April of 1903. This was a terrible pogrom. About 86 Jews were killed, lots of destruction of Jewish property, and a lot of rape of Jewish women and girls. This Kishinev pogrom prompted one of the most important poems in modern Hebrew literature. Most mavens, most specialists in Hebrew literature and Hebrew poetry, believe that the greatest Hebrew poet in the modern period was Chaim Nachman Bialik. Bialik was a man who lived in Odessa. He was a correspondent for a number of newspapers. And he visits, the, he visits Kishinev in the immediate aftermath, aftermath of the pogrom and writes one of the most important poems. Sometimes poems, some poems can be beautiful, but sometimes poems can serve a political, political issue. That is, they can serve a political cause. His poem in the city of slaughter is a biting indictment of traditional Jewry. And he says in the first two paragraphs, it's, it's worth a read, even in English translation, it's worth a read. That's Chaim Nachman Bialik, the city of slaughter. And he looks in and he, what does he see? The city is destroyed. And he looks at these, these from Yidin, these religious Jews, the men, the men who have not resisted, the men who have not done anything. And what are the men doing? The men are going to the rabbis and they say, can I have sexual intercourse with my wife? Because the tradition is, if the, the woman has had sexual intercourse with someone else, the husband is not supposed to have sexual intercourse with her. And he says, mockingly, you are the descendants of the Maccabees. Again, the Maccabean, again, an inspiration. You are the descendants of the Maccabees. How low have you sunk? Your women have been violated. And all you're concerned about is whether you can have sexual intercourse with them. In Russia, the Maccabean revolt will serve as an inspiration for the creation of Jewish self-defense units who will fight against the pogromchiki. So in Russia, it is very, very significant. And in Palestine, in the late 19th century and up until really the, the creation of the state of Israel in 1948, again, people use historical events for their own political interests. The Zionist movement will make a great deal of the Maccabean revolt. I think you can understand for obviously for, for obvious reasons. The Zionist movement is largely secular. They don't give a damn about the miracles lighting the candles. They're fighting the Arabs. They're struggling for their very existence. They look to the Maccabees as heroes, as people who won against overwhelming odds, just as we will. We will follow. We will be inspired by the Maccabees. We will win. And so there were huge parades, torch celebrations, run as men and women will carry the torch of fire and bring it to the Knesset. They will bring it to other parts of Palestine before 1948. So for the Jews living in Palestine and later in Israel, for the Zionist movement, generally speaking, the Maccabean revolt is going to be of great importance, of great inspiration. And then in our own country. Now, there is an unfortunate incident that is linked to Hanukkah. In 1860, but it's the only unfortunate incident in all of American history that is linked with Hanukkah. That is on the first night of Hanukkah, in 1862, in the midst of the Civil War, General Ulysses X. Grant, Ulysses S. Grant, promulgated what was known as Order Number 11. Order Number 11 is the only anti-Semitic act by a high-ranking representative of the American government. Grant thought that Jews who operated in the Tennessee Valley and beyond the Tennessee Valley were cheating people from the Union Army, people who purchased cotton, people who did things in order to support the Union troops. Grant believed that the Jews were cheating them. Probably the fact is the Jews were cheating them, but everybody was cheating the Union Army. He singled out the Jews. This is one of the problems we always have in dealing with an anti-Semite or an anti-Semitic act. He will, for the rest of his life, he will try to play it down and try to make good to the Jews, sometimes even pandering to the Jews. But this is a time when he was moved in an anti-Semitic direction. Why, we do not know. 
Did his father have problems with the Jews? We do not know. But he's ordering all of the Jews, men, women, and children, to be expelled from a vast area. A man by the name of Kaskel in Paducah, Kentucky, will cross the lines into across the Union lines and will eventually make his way to Washington, D.C., where he will meet with Abraham Lincoln, and he will convince Lincoln. He's joined by a number of prominent Jews in the North. They go, they meet with Lincoln, and he is able, they are able to persuade Lincoln. And it doesn't take a great deal of, this, uh, of, of persuasion. Lincoln was a great man, a decent man. And in some ways, you could even argue a philo But Lincoln immediately rescinded order number 11. So this is one of the more dramatic examples of Hanukkah in American history, a linkage with Hanukkah. But for the most, not for the most part, with every other, in every other possible way, Hanukkah will be embraced by the American Jewish community. Even before the Civil War, Jews are beginning to celebrate Hanukkah, lighting the candles and so on. During the Civil War, Hanukkah commemorations are going to be used as fundraisers for the Union Army. And again, the Maccabean Revolt is going to be an inspiration. The Jewish poet, Emma Lazarus, we all know it, give me your struggling, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. Remember the Statue of Liberty. She also wrote a poem, an address to the Jews. Remember the Maccabees. Remember their courage. This should be a model for us all. And then later on, later on, American presidents are going to speak of Hanukkah. And that's an important point here. Again, in dealing with anti-Semitism, we are confronting anti-Semitism today. We know that. We can't be, nobody can be oblivious to that a heightened degree of anti-Semitism. And what makes the, the damage of anti-Semitism today, let's say worse than it was in the past, is that some prominent celebrities have endorsed anti-Semitism. That's why when Teddy Roosevelt praised the Jews of New York State, particularly the Jews in the New York City police force for their bravery and said that they are, he, they remind him of the Maccabeans. That's important stuff. When an American president, when prominent Americans really condemn anti-Semitism, that's really an effective counter, as effective as anything would be, that encountering the anti-Semitism that comes from the celebrities. He's not alone. Others will do it. Harry Truman will do it. Uh, Ronald Reagan will speak about the Maccabees. And of course, George W. Bush will speak about the Maccabees. And George W. Bush is the one that instituted the Hanukkah lighting in the White House. So we are talking about, again, Hanukkah, Hanukkah becoming really almost integral into American society. That is, people know about Hanukkah. It legitimizes the Jewish position in the United States. So this is a Hanukkah has played a very, very important role. Of course, it is a way that some Jews believe that we can counter the appeal of Christmas the tradition of gift giving. This is an American thing. You give gifts at the time of Hanukkah. This is the, it's a way to counter Christmas. Well, that's, uh, you can argue that's not an effective way. There's no effective way of countering Christmas. We cling to our tradition and that's why we observe Hanukkah. So Hanukkah has served a number of purposes in various parts of the world. Now, you gotta forgive me for this. Here I've spent almost 40 minutes talking to you about the importance of Hanukkah. And again, the rising of the Maccabees against Antiochus Epiphanes, the Hellenized Syrians, and against those Jews who, were, who in the eyes of the Maccabees were betraying the Jewish tradition. Let me raise a heretical view with you. I am not a proponent of this, but it has been suggested by a number of historians, both Jewish, Jewish as well as non-Jewish historians. There are many of them but you'll hear more of them. And that is, would it have been so bad that the Maccabees lost the, lost the Civil War? Would it have been better for the Jews in the long run? Again, don't misconstrue what I'm saying. I'm not a proponent of this, but as a historian, it's my obligation to raise what a number of historians have raised, some points that they have raised. What would have been so bad had the Hellenized Jews one, what would have happened? Jews would go, we would have embraced 
Hellenistic and Hellenic, Hellenic civilization, Jews would have begun to study mathematics and physics and all sorts of things. The flip side of that is the Maccabees won and the Jews become somewhat isolated. And that isolation is not going to really end to a very large extent in most of Europe until the Haskalah of the 18th and 19th centuries. I hope you understand what I'm saying, John. Please forgive me. I don't want to, to make this uh, more complex than it is. There is the argument that by winning, by the traditionalists winning, it set the Jews back. It isolated them. It made them into, again, very religious people who isolated themselves from modernizing currents. That's the argument of those who say that the real tragedy is not that the Maccabees won. Well, the real tragedy is that they indeed won, that they indeed win. They won. They won and the Jews settled back into obscurantism. That's the argument. I don't believe that, but I'm telling you, you're going to hear more and more about that. And this is a good example of showing you how history is written and shaped. Sometimes they say history is written by the victors. That's why probably what you're reading in first two Maccabees or the first five books of the Maccabees, that's really written by the victors, the supporters of the Maccabees. There's no, we don't have any secondary evidence here as to what really took place. But history is very often not only written by the victors, but people write history uh, on the basis of what they are living through in the present time. Now, if you were my students at Union, I would ask you, why do you think that in the future, in the near future, the very, very near future, we are going to hear more people say that the Maccabees were religious fruitcakes, that they were religious zealots, and that the long range impact of the Maccabees uh, was, uh, was a negative one on the history of the Jewish people. Again, don't misconstrue this. I do not believe that, but I'm saying you're gonna hear more of that. Why would I say you're gonna hear more of it now? Because of contemporary events within the state of Israel. Israel has the most right-wing coalition government, including, including ultra-religious elements. Within, this is the most right-wing government, most religious government in the entire history of the state of Israel since 1948. And we are going to see, again, I cannot say, I'm, not a, I'm a historian, if I get the history right, I'm doing well. I'm not a prophet. I cannot tell you how this government is going to act, but on the surface, this is a government that is going to do things, is going to move to the right religiously, and that's going to antagonize large numbers of people in Israel, and certainly large numbers of American Jews. And you're going to hear about the dangers of religious zealotry, and this you can take to the bank, that a number of people are going to say, they're gonna look at the Maccabean revolt and say that the wrong side won. But that's not my point of view. Whether you believe in this or not, whether you are a liberal or a conservative, whether you're religious or secular, or whether you're moderately religious or ultra-religious, ultra whatever you think about the Maccabean revolt, it is an astonishing manifestation of courage, an absolutely astonishing manifestation. Outnumbered, no, not out, I can say outgunned, there are no guns that are being used at this time, but the people on the other side, the Hellenized Syrians, have the, model, have the weapons and have the men, but the fact of the matter is going to be that the Jews are going to prevail. And I say this to you, again, I go back to the inspirational aspect of this. This is a tough time for us in the United States. Do you realize I've been giving lectures for over 50 years, and when I talked about American Jewry, I always said the major problem confronting our people in the United States is not anti-Semitism. It was there, I, no one can deny that anti-Semitism was there, but I always emphasize that assimilation was the greatest problem. I still think assimilation is the greatest problem, but never in a million years now, as I did in the past, in the past would I downplay anti-Semitism in the United States. It is a problem for us. Jews have died, synagogues have been attacked, and there's probably more anti-Semitism and physical violence that is actually being recorded. We know many people experience an anti-Semitic act and they don't report it. 
And in certain areas of New York City, particularly in Brooklyn, there have been attacks by African-Americans upon Jews. That doesn't get the press that other anti-Semitic acts get, but it's there. And so what I'm trying to tell you now is we are in a difficult time. On college, this is not the college campus that you, that you went to. It really isn't. I'm teaching at Union College for 55 years, and I'm telling you, at Union and elsewhere, it's a different world. There was a time when you and I were in college when Israel was the darling of liberals. It was. Yom Mood, Israeli Independence Day celebrations, they were all over the place. From left to right, there was a commemoration, a celebration of the state of Israel. Those days are gone. They are gone. And we have got to toughen up our kids and we've got to toughen up ourselves. And that's why, again, over 2,000 years ago, the, Maccab the, Mac uh, Ma the Maccabees set us a good example. There is no substitute for courage. And that's what the American Jewish community is going to have to have. And as we confront a more difficult time, again, don't, uh, don't draw an improper conclusion from me. I am not one that gets up in the morning and sees fascists under the bed. I am not saying the Holocaust is coming here. I'm not saying the apocalypse is about to descend upon us. What I am saying is we are in for a difficult time. The golden age of American Jewry is to a very large extent over. Again, we're going to do well in America and our children and grandchildren are going to do well. But the days when anti-Semitism was almost invisible, those days are gone. And as we confront this difficult time, we ought to remember the example of the Maccabees. They had the guts and the skill, and that's what we've got to develop. We've got to cultivate our courage, develop our courage, and develop the skills to deal with the anti-Semitism. It's not going to lead to an apocalypse. Again, don't, admit, don't be misled by anything I'm saying. I'm not preaching doom and gloom. What I am saying to you is, this is a more difficult time, more difficult, probably the most difficult time since the end of the Second World War. And the problem is, the, the issue is, we have got to strengthen ourselves. Remember, when we finish, when we finish a book of the Torah, what's the, what is, how does every, every, in every synagogue in the world, you finish a book of the Torah, chazak, chazak, benitazek. Be strong, be strong, and let us strengthen ourselves. And as we strengthen ourselves, let's draw inspiration from the Maccabees. Jeffrey, I'm yours. All right, Professor Burke. As always, Professor Burke, thank you for your insight, for your illumination. I uh, am sure that everybody joins me in, uh, in uh, sharing my gratitude to you for your time and expertise and uh, uh, just uh, kind of bringing to life the story uh, in a way that uh, maybe we wouldn't otherwise encounter at this time of year. So uh, there's a lot of lessons to be learned. I'm sure there's going to be questions that people uh, have. As always, uh, if you're familiar with these programs, uh, folks, you can uh, leave any questions that you would like in the Q&A. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, I've had a couple of people ask uh, privately on the, uh, the chat whether this program is recorded. Yes, this is a recorded program. And so uh, we'll have that available uh, publicly afterwards. If you know other people who might be interested in uh, seeing it, we'll, we'll send out a link that you can uh, share. A couple of very uh, nice uh, comments in the in the chat uh, uh, for you, Professor Burke. Fantastic, thank you, thank you again for hosting this. Um, so, first question for you, Professor Burke, uh, from an anonymous attendee: Would you consider this is uh, we we always like to start with the the good loaded questions? Okay, ready for this? Uh, would you consider Meir, Meir Kahana, uh and that kind of vigilant, vigilantism a modern Maccabee? based on current anti-Semitism. Give me the first part of it. Would I consider what, Jeffrey? Mayor Kahana. Oh, my, my Rabbi Kahana. Yeah. Hey, Rabbi Kahana, everybody calls Rabbi Kahana a racist. I've read some of his stuff. He's harsh as hell on the Arabs. I don't think he talks about moral or intellectual inferiority of the Arabs. That would mock him as a racist. Kahana believed... I hope he's wrong. Kahana believed that the Arabs and Jews 
are not going to get along. That as long as there's an Arab minority in Israel, the Jews are going to have trouble. And the only way to deal with it is to be take a harsh response. I'm not sure he ever advocated the deportation of the Arabs from within the Green Line to beyond the Green Line. Uh, but he was, he was coming close to doing that. And then the issue is, uh, you know, oh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, Jeffrey. You know, these <laughs> people are going to get terribly upset, what I'm about to say. To say a good word about Rabbi Kahana is like saying a good word about Donald Trump. People get terribly upset by it. And uh, well, that I can understand with good reason. But Kahana became famous because he dealt with an issue that is rising again, and that's black anti-Semitism. Those Jews who live, not the Jews uh, of, let's say, the nice neighborhoods in Brooklyn or on the island of Long or in Westchester and in suburban New Jersey, not those Jews, but the Jews of Crown Heights, the Jews of Williamsburg, who live side by side with African-Americans and were experiencing violence. He acted, that's why there's the Jewish Defense League, he acted to defend them. He brought a certain amount of attention that was not there to this problem. And then, again, it's a matter of debate. He also sounded the alarm upon Soviet Jewry, that the Jews wanted to get out, the Soviets weren't going to allow them to get out, so we've got to do certain things. You throw blood against the, the Soviet consulate in New York City. You begin to hassle Soviet diplomats. That probably was counterproductive, but, in the, but one can, what one can say is that it did alert American Jews to the issue of Soviet Jewry. So Kahana is, at least to my mind, a mixed bag. But in his latter years, he was getting carried away. He was coming close to crossing that red line, moving in the direction of racism, and taking a position that, if it was endorsed by Israel, would lead to civil war, a program for Israel, and isolation of Israel within the international community. So what do I think the answer to Rabbi Kahana? Well, was he a modern day Maccabee? Maybe in the beginning, maybe in the beginning. But uh, I would not say he should be our inspiration. Uh, okay, several of those questions coming in. Before we get to those, um, you touched uh, a little bit on uh, just the, the using the, the model or the ideal of the, the Maccabees in, in more modern times in the early 1900s in, in Russia. Uh, I wonder if you could speak a, a little bit about uh, the use of the idea of, of the Maccabees and, and uh, particularly um, Jews fighting back uh, and its relation to how it was used in Israel around the, the foundation of the state of Israel. Sure. I, I mean, this. I, I tried to say that in the talk. The Maccabees were a, an inspiration for the Zionist movement, particularly for the secular Zionist movement. Those torch parades, the running of the torches, the running of marathons, all of this. And of course, the IDF, and before the IDF, the Haganah, was inspired. This is where the way Jews are to, be, uh, to behave. They don't need, the Jews do not need, the Zionist movement is going to say, the Jews do not need people uh, in Kapota. They don't need Jews with pace. They, know they don't need Jews that pray three times a day or even more times a day. We need people who can fight. And the Maccabees gave an example of that. Now, it's also true that the Maccabees, let's say, uh, amalgamated or joined religiosity with, with ferocity, with martial prowess. But indeed, for the secular Zionist movement and for the state of Israel, the Maccabees, just like Masada, just like Masada, Proved to buy, be an inspiration. Israeli tank commanders are brought to Masada. We will, they swear an oath, we will never let Masada fall again. And many Jews, again, inspired by the Maccabees. We, are, we live in a world of shocks. We live in, or to use the more elegant way, is uh, Israel is a good country in a bad neighborhood. All of this is true. Israel has to fight, and the Maccabees are our inspiration. So yes, the Maccabees are an inspiration to modern Israel. All right, we've got very interesting. Three people wrote in about uh, the same topic, so I'm gonna I'm gonna share them all so you can uh, uh, address this. Uh, it's all about the the idea of if the Hellenized Jews had had won. Uh, Barbara Pankin writes, if the Maccabees lost, 
would the Hellenized Jews have, have continued to assimilate into Jewish oblivion? Dale Hammer writes, if the Maccabees had lost and Jewish-Greek assimilation had continued, there might not be any people today that we could call Jews. And Bruce Lerner writes, if the Maccabees had lost the war, would Judaism have survived? Uh, it's so, all the same stuff. And the yeah. answer is, you want to know the honest answer, to, Jeffrey? The honest answer is, ready for me now, I'm going to give you an elegant language. Damned if I know. <laughs> now, this the point here is this. It is somewhat similar. With the Jews, let's say the Maccabees had, had lost, and the, the Hellenized Jews would have prevailed. How much would they have jettisoned, and how much would they have kept? Would they have worshipped Zeus in the temple? In the first books of the Maccabees, it says that uh, Antiochus Epiphanes put an, an idol of Zeus. Would they, have, would they have accepted that? Would they have abandoned Kashrut? Would they have abandoned the Torah? I can't answer that. But again, what I tell you, look at us. Look, look at us. We have acculturated. And some of us have gone beyond acculturation into assimilation. Have we abandoned it? Have all of those Jews? I'll bet you out there. You had over four, you had close to 450 people looking look at this program. How many of you do you think were wearing a kippah? Very few. Very few. Unless they just finished lighting the candles. But very, very few. Have they abandoned the Torah? The answer is no. Many of them. Many of them at least have a modicum uh, of religiosity. So it's not a straight downward path. I mean, these, this is what some historians would argue. It's not a straight downward path. Had the Maccabees lost, all the Judaism would have disappeared from the face of the earth. I don't know. I don't know. What we do know is the Jews cling to their, their places, they cling to their religion, and shut themselves off. Not completely. That's an exaggeration. Even with the victory of the Maccabees, look at, the, look at some of the things. Look at, look at the, the way we, let us say, uh, examine the Torah. We use logic to examine the Torah. That's from the Greeks. If you, if, for those of you who pray in the morning, you pick up a conservative or an orthodox sidur, you get the laws, how you arrive from one principle to another. That's Greek logic that's taking place there. So it's not true that with the, again, it's not true that with the, because the Maccabees won, there was total isolation. There wasn't. There's no iron curtain. There never is an iron curtain. There's no iron wall. You can't keep out Greek influence. In fact, some of the Maccabees will take Greek names. So the point is, the questions are, these are very good. This is about the best audience I get here. This is, the, the, the answers are very, the questions are very, very good, but this is hypothetical history. This is what would have happened had something taken place. Can't answer that. Well, you can make speculation. I've tried to make the speculation. My own feeling is when all is said and done, I'm glad the Maccabees won. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I mean, we got latkes out of it, so that's pretty good. Um, all right. We, we've got uh, several questions about anti-Semitism. Before we get to that, let's let's go back a little further. Uh, Rabbi Henry Zub would like to know uh, oh, what Rabbi is the. Zub, let me say hello, Rabbi Zub. So Rabbi Zub would like to know uh, what's the evidence for Egyptian anti-Jewishness outside of the Book of Exodus. Jo the evidence for that is Josephus. Josephus wrote about Egyptian anti-Judaism. That's how we know about it. One of his most famous books is against, against Apion. Again, this is a condemnation. It's a point by point refutation by Josephus against the anti Judaism of the Egyptians and the, the, uh, the anti Judaism that is in the Egyptian narrative. That's the primary source. Do you, do you consider Josephus to be uh, a uh, reliable source? Uh, do I consider Josephus to be a reliable source? Now, that's a difficult question. First of all, we don't have, sometimes you don't have other sources. We have to rely on Josephus. 
Josephus was a man of his time. In the sense, he wrote history as uh, in a way that we would never tolerate today. He puts words into the mouths of his characters. So for example, Josephus tells us about Masada and tells us about the last speech that is made by the leader, Eliezer Benier, about, you know, we can't allow our women to become prostitutes and slaves, we will not allow our children. He may never have said that. He's the only source we have for Masada. He puts words into his mouth. That's why when I go, when we go on an Ayala trip and we go to Warsaw and we stand where Miwa 18 was, that's where the Jewish head, the headquarters of the Jewish fighting organization were. I say, that we know about. That's the greatest example of Jewish bravery in the modern, in probably in all of history. We know that at Masada, the Jews fought. We know that they committed suicide. That we know. But beyond that, we do not know. So Josephus, and Josephus relies, when he talks about Hanukkah, and talks about the Maccabees, he's relying on the first two, uh, the, the first two books of the Maccabees. Now, Josephus is, again, a man of his time. Remember, Josephus, Josephus was a traitor. He was a general fighting against the Romans and then turned, turned over to the side of the Romans. So that's going to influence things that he writes. But in fairness to Josephus, he never wrote disparagingly about the Jews, never never wrote disparagingly about the Jews. And he was a defender of the Jews against the anti-Judaism, both of the, some of the Romans, but particularly of the Egyptians. And again, I come back to something that I said in the lecture. He asked the question, I've asked this question all the time. And 2000 years ago, it was asked of Josephus, where does it begin? Why is it there? And Josephus's answer was, it all begins with the Egyptians. So, Josephus is talking to us about anti-Judaism in the ancient world. We know from Roman literature, there was a good deal of hostility towards the Jews. But please, again, don't, don't misread this. There was a good deal of philo-Semitism. Jews were, Jews were looked upon in an admirable way for their high degree of ethics, for their, the absence of paganism, the belief in the one God. People liked that. They liked that about the Jews. In fact, there's an estimate that large numbers of people living in the Roman Empire, one for one historian says, one third of the people living in the Roman Empire were either Jews or a group of people known in English as the god -fearers. Whether it's one third or one tenth, there were large numbers of people, large numbers of Jews living in the Roman Empire. So the ancient world is a mixed bag. Anti-Judaism stemming from Egypt, some philo-Semitism, and indeed, the primary source on all of this is again, is again, Josephus. Where Josephus becomes a little, where the, where the books of Josephus become a little bit unreliable, and again, challenged by historians. Again, he puts words into, the, into people, and then he does something else. There is a long paragraph in Josephus, which talks about the coming of Jesus, and refers to him as the Messiah. Many historians believe that Josephus never wrote that never wrote it, that this was inserted into a third or fourth century edition of Josephus by Catholic monks. So again, for many, in many cases, he's the only source that we have. We have to take him with a grain of salt, but he was very, very knowledgeable and tells us things that no other source tells us. All right, before we get into the several questions about uh, modern times, anti-Semitism, things uh, of those uh, along those lines, I have an interesting question from Stuart Block, who writes in, is there a relationship between the descending number of sacrifices on Sukkot and the descending number of candles advocated by Beit Shammai? First of all, that's a question for Rabbi Zub more than myself. The <laughs> second thing is the Maccabees, when they cleaned the sanctuary, did in fact relate there, they wanted to relate the commemoration of this to Sukkot. That they did. And so what I'm saying to you is, I wouldn't get into the Beit Shammai thing that uh, it's the eight candles that are important. Eight candles for the eight day for, for Sukkot. 
That is, it was going to, that is the Hanukkah commemoration as envisioned and by practiced by the Maccabees and for generations thereafter was modeled on Sukkot. That we know. All right. I can't avoid it. There's too many questions about anti-Semitism. So we're, we're going to have to uh, hit a couple of these here. Um, all right. Let's, let's start with uh, this one. Brad Gornstein writes in, Dara Horn's book, People Love Dead Jews, talks about American Jews deliberately changing their names to avoid severe American anti-Semitism prior to World War II. That's how probable, yeah. How probable is it that anti-Semitism will again increase to the point that Jews feel the need to hide their identities to avoid discrimination? That is already happening on American college campuses. Not in Union, but it's happening, at least I don't know about it happening at Union, but it's happening in other places where Jewish students are telling us they don't wear mezuzah anymore, they don't wear a Jewish star. Uh, and they don't talk about Israel anymore. And when the issue of Israel comes up, they remain silent. So it is already happening in certain quarters of American society. Whether name changes will take place, I, that I don't know. I, I don't think that's going to be the case. But again, I, I'm repeating myself here when I tell you it's a different college campus that when you and I were, when you and I were accustomed to. There are, there are places where the anti-Israeli sentiment is so great and where the, those who are anti-Zionist, anti-Israeli are going to equate all Jews with Zionism and are going to say, as they did at the University of, uh, the University of California Law School in Berkeley, some of the organizations say, we will not allow any Zionist speakers to come. And so that's going to be, and in some places, Jewish students have been harassed. So we know, and again, it's the response that is so significant here. How do people respond? How do young people respond? How do older people respond? Some people take a low profile position. Uh, some people, again, the worst aspect of this is they become self-hating Jews, or at the very least, they deny completely their Jewishness. But on the other hand, I have seen people, I've seen young people who confronting anti-Semitism, they toughen up. They become proud Jews, and they prepare to fight. That's what we've got to cultivate. But Brad Ornstein, is, he, he's got a point there. there. There's no question there. Some people, particularly younger people, are trying to hide their Jewishness. Whether that means, uh, again, a complete divorce from the Jewish community and from Judaism, leading ultimately to some sort of conversion, that has happened in the past. It's happened in the past. I do not think it has reached that level in American society today. All right, uh, a couple more and then we'll start to, to uh, wrap up. Uh, if people haven't lit candles yet, maybe they need to go light candles. Uh, from Carla Marcus, uh, she writes in, Baruch Spinoza said that anti-Semitism was the greatest gift to Jews because it demanded that they maintain and identify with their or our peoplehood. Uh, and so I'm just going to, that was just a comment she said that I'm sure you have something to comment on. I'm going to combine that with a question from Jane Joseph, who writes in, apart from having courage, what concrete steps do you think American Jews should take to counter anti-Semitism? Right. Let's see with the first one thing, the, the quote from Spinoza. There are other, many people who have said that the best thing for Jews is anti-Semitism because it forces Jews to, to confront what they are it strengthens them and so on. Uh, there are some people who even say a little bit of anti-Semitism is good for the Jews. I don't believe that for a single moment because I think about the slippery slope. Anti-Semitism is a danger to us because it can, it can morph, it, can, it can, can grow, it can escalate. You never want anti-Semitism uh, to save the Jews. There's gotta be other ways to save the Jews. Now I link that I'll link that question to the second. The second question is, what do we do? Well, the first thing is, again, uh, I, I don't mean to be extremely militant here. We've got to defend ourselves. I belong to a synagogue. Uh, you know, I'm down in South Florida for the winter. My synagogue puts on a, a special surcharge. They've got a guy with a loaded gun who marches around that synagogue. We've got to heighten security. 
At the very least, at the very beginning, we've got to heighten security. The second thing we have to do is to demand, to demand of those in authority, regardless of the political party, regardless of being a liberal or conservative, we must demand that people speak out against anti-Semitism. I must say, I, I, was, I was very happy that President Obama, former President Obama, addressed celebrity anti-Semitism and said that it had to be rejected. President Biden has done that as well. And that, uh, again, that's good stuff. We need people not to equivocate on anti-Semitism. I think former President Trump, I think, uh, again, you can make a case that President Trump, Trump did good things for Israel. I actually think he did. I think the abrogation of the, uh, the treaty with, not the treaty, the agreement with Iran, the movement to the capital to Jerusalem, that was, a good, that was good stuff. But his sitting down with Kanye Ye and Nick, uh, Nick Fuentes, that's terrible stuff. I mean, to give a certain amount of legitimacy to virulent anti-Semites, to people, to a man that says, I like Hitler, I'm gonna make war against the Jews and stuff like that. That's just bad stuff. So at every level, at every level, we must demand, we must demand that people, that people speak out against anti-Semitism. We must also link ourselves with large numbers of people in the general American public. I know there's anti-Semitism in American society, but the American people are a good people. Most of them reject anti-Semitism. And we've got to establish linkages with them. And if we can't do it on moral grounds, then we can do it on more pragmatic grounds. Anti-Semitism is like the canary in the mine. That is, everybody should know that if they come against the Jews, they will eventually come against other people as well. And they will transform American society into a society the likes of which most Americans, the overwhelming majority of Americans would reject. And then we've got to strengthen ourselves. I tried to say that. We've got to teach our kids and teach ourselves, teach ourselves about what Jewish history is all about. What we don't need, and forgive me, I don't need to be condescending here, I really don't. We don't need well-intentioned ignoramuses. We need people who are familiar with our story, with what took place in Israel, what's happening in Israel, what's happening in American society. We need people who are learned. There's no, there's no reason now not to be well informed. There's a plethora of Jewish publications. Oh, you're liberal, conservative, reconstructionist, author, that doesn't make any difference. Reform, I, it's there. There's no excuse for any Jew to be uninformed about contemporary issues and about the basic issues of the basic uh, institutions within the uh, basic ideas of Judaism. So again, we've got to strengthen ourselves here, know our story know about our religion, have the guts to, to, to con not to confront, but to respond to a confrontation. That's what we've got to be able to do. So I think these are the things, no guarantee in this world. Either you believe in the basic decency of the American people or you do not. Either you believe that there's a future here for the Jewish people or you do not. If you don't, you get out. If you really don't believe that the American people are decent, that will reject anti-Semitism, if you do not believe that American institutions are strong enough to protect all minorities, including the Jews, then it's time to get out of the United States. I don't feel that way. I believe there is a future for us. I believe that this is a remarkable country, the greatest country in the world. I believe that there is a future for us. But in order to guarantee that future, we should link ourselves with other groups, know our story and have the guts to deal with those who are attacking us. So uh, Barbara Pankin writes in, she says uh, along these lines, uh, Gil Troy advocates Pilates Judaism, uh, excuse me, Pilates Zionism. We must uh, strengthen our core. Uh, it's a, that's a nice uh, 
a uh, good way to phrase it. So, Professor Burke, before we start to wrap up here, uh, just I just want to remind people, we talked about it at the beginning, uh, we've got amazing uh, things going on in 2023. Uh, I hope you'll consider joining Professor Burke in, in Italy, in Eastern Europe, in Cuba, uh, or join one of our other tours. Uh, like I said, we've got a Croatian cruise coming up in the fall. Uh, we've got the Argentina trip coming up in March and lots and lots of other great stuff. Hadassah trips for 2023 are just starting to roll out right now. Uh, you can spend Yom Ha'atzmaut in Israel with Hadassah. Uh, really amazing things. So uh, one last question before we uh, wrap up here, Professor Burke. Uh, we've got uh, a question from June Schechner, who writes in, who or what group would you say are most like the Maccabees in today's society? Ah, uh, June, June, June. June was my student at Union. A very good student and a tough cookie. June was also on our trip to Cuba and was a very good participant in that trip. It's hard to say, June, uh, I'm not waffling on this. There are people in all Reformed, Conservative, Orthodox uh, congregations or members of the community, Jews among secular people. There's no one particular group that stands out, but there are people in all groups that really stand out that really have that really show themselves uh, able and willing to deal with the, the difficult times that we are in. That's not a waffle, June. It's just I'm be trying to be as honest as I can. There's no one group that is a monopoly on courage or a monopoly on the truth. So wherever you find these people, link yourselves to these people. And one last word I would say about the Cuban trip. You know, I've been working with Ayala for over, over 25 years, close to 30 years here. And I must tell you, we do, they, the, the company does a good job. And more than that, going back to the Cuban trip, we keep, I yell it together with us, keeps these Jewish communities afloat. And in fact, wherever we go, I yell it makes a donation. And so too do the people who go on the trips. One of the things that we do in all of these trips, we are going to places where there are very, very few Jews. We see all the places that everybody else sees, but we also see, and I tell people, if you want to be interested in seeing Jewish things, go on a Jewish trip. I hope you would go with us, but if you don't go with us and you're interested in Jewish things, make sure you're going on a Jewish tour. And our tour, we keep in Santa Clara, Cienfuegos, Trinidad, Havana, I yell it as a company and the people who come on these trips. And we do the same thing in Prague. We do the same thing in Warsaw. We do the same thing wherever we go. So in addition to having a good time, an I yell a trip is a trip in which you perform a mitzvah. So my friends, enough from me and even enough from Jeffrey. It's all over for now. Hope we'll see each other again. Shalom uvracha. Stay warm. Stay well. Thank you very much for listening. As always, thank you, Professor Burke. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Happy Hanukkah to one and all. And we will see you again in 2023. Shalom. It's Jeff from Ayala Tours. Hope you enjoyed that video. Remember to catch all of our creative content by subscribing to our YouTube channel.